Welcome back to this episode of HBCU. On this episode, Dr. Charles Barron has joined me and Nathaniel Clark for a panel discussion. Dr. Charles Barron is a board certified family practice physician and was appointed recently as the chief medical officer for Aunt Martha's Health and Wellness. Dr. Barron is a graduate of two HBCUs, Cahoma Community College in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and Alcorn State University. He is also a member of the greatest fraternity in the world, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Charles, welcome to HBCU. Nate, Thank you. welcome back. Glad to have you guys on the show. Now, Charles, you and Nate both attended Cahoma Community, Community College, and then you left there and went in separate directions. But tell me about your time at, at Cahoma and then also at Alcorn State University. Okay. Well, thanks for having me, uh, Dee. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, uh, my times at Cahoma and um, Alcorn were, were great. Um, you know, growing up in the Clarksdale, Fries Point, Mississippi area, um, Cahoma Community College was a staple of the community. And, um, you know, and at that time, you know, that was the place to be. You know, yeah. we went to high school and we went to Cahoma and then we went our separate ways or decided what our next steps were. And uh, my experiences there were more so like just family oriented, uh, people that really cared about you, really yeah. were focused on making sure that you were the best you. Right. And, um, and that's what really helped me uh, with giving me a foundation to uh, propel in whatever I chose to do uh, going forward. And it was the same at Alcorn. You know, we get down there and it's still kind of that family oriented type of situation. If you miss class or weren't at class, they would send somebody to get you or right. like somebody <laughs> knocking on your door and it's, it's your uh, professor sitting there like, um, I know you was hanging out with the Kappas last night, but you need to come to biology <laughs> class, you know. So, um, so it was just, you know, that type of atmosphere right. that, that really gave you a feeling of someone that really cared about you and yeah. someone was really focused on your success. Absolutely. Nate, you want to come in on, on your experience? It's, it's the same, you know. Yeah. I think back when we both uh, had hair, possibly, and, <laughs> and didn't have this gray in the beard, right? right, right. You know, it's uh, family, man. It's, it's yeah. the family experience. And uh, to see another brother, you know, our age doing great things, is, right. it's just wonderful that you can look back on that history mm -hmm. of HBCU graduate, right, uh, or attendee, right, right, right. Um, and, and just kind of share uh, these kind of conversations and discussions about our successes. You right. Know, it's just a wonderful time. And I think one of the things that don't need to be missed in this conversation is the fact that that extra nurturing yeah. mm -hmm. that's, that's given at HBCUs is oftentimes needed yes. to, to, for that individual to truly be successful, to mm -hmm. really pull them along. And that's one of the things that you cannot get when you attend a non-HBCU institution, that you just end up being a number, mm -hmm. and you end up just, you just have to fend for yourself, but nobody's gonna come looking for you. If you don't right, wanna come no. to class, <laughs> right. you're on your own. You just won't be you're there, just right? Get, you're just gonna get an F. <laughs> <laughs> you can put a tape recorder on your chair sometimes and leave. That's right, yeah, they don't that's care. That's how disconnected it is at right. times. Right, yeah. right. It's, it's true. Mm -hmm. But now both of you all have gone on to have very successful careers. Uh, Charles, you as the chief medical officer, Nate, as you, the managing part, partner of your own architectural firm, tell me about your organization and what you all do. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'm the chief medical officer of, of Aunt Martha's Health and Wellness, and uh, we're a group of fairly qualified health centers in the state of Illinois. We have 26 health centers and 30 sites. We're the only um, group, uh, FQAC group, that is also licensed by DCFS of the state of Illinois. So we... Um, First, we do primary care, comprehensive medical uh, care with uh, anywhere from pediatrics, OB, psychiatry, behavioral health, right. uh, regular primary care. And then we also work with youth in care. So um, we have um, contracts with uh, DCFS to take care of some of the most complex youth in the state of Illinois. So we have a facility um, in Chicago where these youth come and we kind of, it's a transition point for them where we work with them to get them ready to go back out into the community. So these kids could be displaced from um, foster care, displaced from home, coming from the juvenile uh, detention, right. um, or, or uh, medically uh, hospitalized for behavior or medical problems. And we bring these kids in and we just wrap our arms around them to make sure that they, uh, we, we can do everything to prepare them to be successful in the communities. Wow, that's, that's great work. Uh, I, w I would imagine that you're dealing with a lot of uh, children from communities of color uh, yes, and that's yes. with, with the, the services that you provide. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel like um, your work 
really help serve your purpose, though? Well, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's encouraging for these youth and our, my patients or our patients in, in our agency um, to see someone that looks like them. You know, there's a level of trust when someone that looks like you walk into the room right. or when they say, hey, I got you. We're going to help you find a permanent placement or I got you. I, I know what you're going through. I know the social determinants that you're dealing with. Right. And when you can relate to someone like that and they can really feel it, then, I mean, it just makes it a little bit easier right. You know, right. to get that trust going and to really get them engaged yeah. and stay engaged. Absolutely. Nate, tell us about CHASM. Um, Chasm Architecture founded in 2005. Uh, we have a staff of about 20, 22 right now. We're the uh, architect of record for some of the largest uh, entities in the state of Louisiana as well as Georgia. Uh, we're the corporate architect for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, we've been that for about 13 years now. Uh, if you've flown into Atlanta uh, anytime recently, uh, we designed the canopies uh, over the roadways. Those canopies can light up to different things for the Super Bowl. Uh, for any type of event that may be going on in Atlanta. They may be green in the next couple of weeks uh, for St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> right. uh, but um, so many projects and, and opportunities to, like you're saying, you know, um, go into the, these communities like Jefferson County, where Arkansas, where they haven't built a, a new project in quite some time, and we can go into those communities as the P3 group and Chasm Architecture and show them that African-American-led companies can bring brand new really quali quality projects to these communities. Right. And these are, these are projects that are not, you know, they're not airports, but they're fire stations and they're health units. And they're all these types of facilities that municipalities and the public and the communities need right. uh, because they interface with these spaces on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. And, you know, to bring that level of uh, commitment back to the communities that look like us that need it most right. is what this panel and what this discussion and what you know HBCUs bring as a fabric to the communities. Just right. giving back right. that right. Uh, mm -hmm. that you know. I talk. I, I was talking to someone. Um, well, I, I talk about this often. Projects that we develop are not the projects that, and everyone laugh, I say they're not the sexy projects, right? right? We, you know, we're building. We make them sexy, though. Well, they're sexy looking, <laughs> but, you know, you know, you know, people don't really just say, oh, that's a, a fire station right there, man. You know, <laughs> man, that courthouse, in fact, they're probably trying to stay out of the courthouse. <laughs> but, right, right. But those, those projects are the fiber, fabric of the communities. Yes. Uh, the services that they provide are critical to the survival and the growth uh, and sustainability of those communities. So whether you're building a health center mm -hmm. or whether you're building classroom facilities or any of those type of projects, they make a, a significant difference in the, in the community. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. and, and just, I want to pivot back though to HBCUs because I don't want to let y'all off the yard just yet. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Let's go back to the yard for, the, for a minute. You know, the HBCU space, uh, the yard offer a totally different uh, experience than you can get just about anywhere else in the world. So. Mm -hmm. So, Charles, tell me about being on the yard at Alcorn. What was it, oh, you know, the sound man. of dynamite, the <laughs> braves, being on the hill, you know? <laughs> right, right, all of that, all of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a, a great experience. And, you know, the funny thing is that when I left Cahoma, <clears throat> I actually went to Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, um, for a summer program, and I was considering going there, and it just didn't feel right. Yeah. You know, and um, so... Uh, one of the guys that I was in the program with was he um, was an alkanite, and he was like, "Man, come on down, come on with up, come on with me." And I'd already gotten the uh, offer, a scholarship offer at Alcorn, so I was like, "Ah, went home and said, Mom, Dad, I can, ah, I'm gonna go to Alcorn, you know." Yeah. And uh, both of them went to Valley. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so then that was an issue too. Like, well, if you gonna go to the HBCU? Why not why, go to why Valley? Not go to I mean, Valley. Got nothing wrong with Valley, but I grew up on the campus, you know, right. with going uh, to visit with them and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, but I went and got on the yard, man, Alcorn, and. Um, it was just, it was fantastic, man. I mean, it's just, again, it was the same atmosphere I had just come from. Right. With, from Cahoma right. to Alcorn. It was just exact, almost the exact same thing. That feeling right. of family, that, you right. know, that camaraderie. Energy. And, and energy. Yeah. Right, you know, and we all come in basically from the, the same place. Right, you know? right. And it's like, hey, man, let's, let's go. <laughs> and uh, just motivating each other and all of those different type of things. And um, so, yeah, I think it, it was just... Um, 
just a wonderful um, experience. It just helped me continue to grow. Yeah. Um, and, at, and at my pace. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? Right. I didn't have to try to be somebody who I was not right. to try to keep up with a, a certain group or Absolutely. whatever. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, I like agree. I can just, yeah. I can just grow. Because, it, because there are so many people from the same circumstances, same background right, right. that you can lean on right. and that, you know, you're leaning on each other. Right. And so right. there, as they say, there's no shame in, in my game. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. And some guys, you don't even know their real name, you know. <laughs> right. 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 If you, you know. were in the corner and asked for Charles Barron, they would not know. <laughs> what Charles Barron? Oh, there he is over I there. Know, right? I, I know, know him, but I don't know <laughs> him. And I would ask him. And I mean, yeah, like, okay. you know, 30 years later, it's like, man, you know Skillet Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But nah, man, that's that, that's it. You know, just that real, that real family. Yes, yeah, it's, a, it's a it's a great experience. I mean, I was on the yard for a year at Alcorn, and I left and went to the University of Memphis, man, and it was just like a rude awakening right. uh, in terms of just culturally the whole difference. Right. And I know you all both at different points. You for med school and you for architectural school left and went to a non HBCU uh, mm -hmm. institution as well. What was that like for you? culture shock for me. Um, Same. Yeah. <laughs> you know, going to the University of Iowa, and I mean, and, you know, and I have to say that for what I was there for, the experience was great. Yeah. You know, um, and I was fortunate to go at a time where they had uh, minority support programs there, so it was really focused on helping us get through. Right. And, um, but, man, getting off that plane in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and <laughs> seeing cornfields, and you know, and nobody that looked like me, I was like, I'm calling home, man. <laughs> Mom, man, I can't do this, I can't do this. And she's like, hang up on me, like, boy, get off my phone, you know. Right, right. But, um, you know, once, and again, uh, and I'll say too that the Greek life helped me because at, at Iowa, once I kind of saw a couple brothers and um, got into, found out where the frats hung out and, right. and, and the blacks hung out, then it kind of made it a little bit better and more yeah. palatable, I guess, you know. Right. But, um, yeah, it was a totally different experience. I think it was 10 minorities in a class of like 150, 200 uh, right. medical students. Yeah. And so you're, you're, again, you're isolated, you right. know what I'm saying? Yes. Because you're, it's just this group. And you guys got to support each other to get through. And, right. um, but it's like that in your profession. Yeah. So yeah. then it becomes training, right? You know, yeah. It's like yeah. training day for four <laughs> right, days. Right, right. Yeah. So it prepares you for right, that. Yeah. Does. For the for the real yeah. real world, I guess you could say. Um, and and I think the two going back that HBCU experience prepares you yes. for all types of adversity. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it prepares you. I mean, you know, just kind of I can, I will type of thing. Like, I, I got to make this happen. Right. You know, right. there's no turning back. There's no going back home. I call mom and she hangs up. Over right. Me, you know what I'm You're saying? not so coming back like, here. Right. But right. you can't disappoint those voices, right? right. I yeah. mean, I mean, I showed up to LSU wearing cross colors. <laughs> 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 right. Who's the tall guy with the green pants? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the culture shock, but it's not that it's also culture shock, but you're also educating folks who have never met Mm -hmm. Right. Driven, young, intelligent black men. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's true. I, I remember I met a young lady and we were we were just having a conversation and she was from Germany. And that's the other thing about going to some of the majority schools. You meet friends from all over from the all world. world. Mm -hmm. right. And she said to me, she said, Orlando, because that's my middle name and that's what I went by in, in, in school. She said, Orlando, um, don't take offense to this. But when I first met you, I was afraid of you. Because in Germany, they only show African-American males robbing people, hurting people, mm -hmm. harming people, beating up people. And when I met you, it was a totally different understanding of black men. Right. And I said, I'm, I'm glad to have been the example that helped to change your mindset. Absolutely. Because you can't believe what's happening on your tube, you really got to get out and meet folks. Right. And we have to do that as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Culturally, we have to get out and we have to travel the world. Absolutely. We have to open our own dialogue up and not be so closed-minded. And I think it's not just it was culture shock to us, but it was probably culture <laughs> shock to them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To, yeah. to encounter yeah. folks like us right. that are really driven and, you know, really about the business of the profession that we're pursuing. It's interesting. They come, they go from fearing us to imitating us, right? Trying to be like us, you know, <laughs> you yeah. know, you know uh, just adopting our culture. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, this is something you were afraid of. Now you're loving it, and you right. want to be a part of it. Right. So, yeah.
So, you know, uh, one of the things I wanted to wanted to touch on during this uh, show was the fact that st statistically African-American children uh, have a significant deficit when it comes to uh, academic readiness. There, 57 percent of African-American kids don't have adequate access to college readiness, readiness material. 50 percent of more actually score uh, below the um, the uh, average uh, benchmarks on ACT and other standardized tests. And when those type of scenarios exist, they cannot enter into uh, these majority institutions. They reject them. And so HBCUs are the institutions at that point that they have to turn to if they're going to continue their academic careers because typically that's where you're going to find programs and opportunities to allow you an opportunity to get into college and despite the fact that you may have had these uh, deficits. And my question is, why is it that this actually exists? I mean, this is just a fact, right? Why is there not a more concerted effort to really highlight and uplift uh, these institutions because they are serving a vital role in our communities? Mm -hmm. The short answer? The short answer really is the, the there is there is some benefit to not educating African American people, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's about generating revenue and legacy long term, right? And I think we have to be in a position to say that it's okay to be the smartest person in the classroom, that it's okay to be an owner instead of an employee, right? That you know, all these things are, are so critical to growing legacy. And the only way that you can get through that is to have platforms like this to, I think, acknowledge the fact that, yes, it exists. Yeah. So what are we going to do about it? Right, right, right. Yeah. I, think, I think it has to be deliberate, though. Whatever yes. those steps are, it has to be a concerted and deliberate effort Agreed. Uh, in order to try to change that narrative. And, of course, you see um, on television now at Jackson State, Deion Sanders is using his platform yes. to try to do um, just that. And, of course, uh, we have supported um, uh, Jackson State mm -hmm. as well as mm -hmm. Alcorn State as well with scholarships mm -hmm. and endowments mm -hmm. and donations. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to... As a as a collective, you know, being within that community of color, make that concerted effort that we're going to try to help uplift yes, uh, these institutions and 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 show that you can go there and perform and succeed, and that you have real life examples that you can touch, and in, in, in occupation and careers that you can do if you so desire. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's important. Yeah, and I, and I you know I think too that. <clears throat> We get caught up in, as successful African Americans, we get caught up into, you know, I want better for my child. I want them to go to Harvard, Yale, and, and you know, you right. get caught up into all of that. Right. But the real thing is, is that, um, I think it's, it's, and I, I can't remember the, the exact author of this, but he talked about elite institution cognitive disorder. Yeah. And it talks about how, if, Ten if you're at the top ten percent of your class, basically, no, where, no matter what college you go to, if mm -hmm. you're at the top ten percent of your class, you're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And that top ten percent at um, Alcorn, Jackson State, or whatever, tend to be more successful than the bottom ninety percent of those schools, those students that go to other, you know, you know right. other universities. Right. So, you know. We have to get out of that where they have to go. No, they don't. They just have to be driven. They have to know what their purpose is. They have to know, right. um, stay grounded. Right. Yes. What is your focus? We can kick it. We can have a great time at the HBCU, but the bottom line is to get your education. Right. You know, and, that, and that's what we have to stay on. You know? And um, that's why those systems, that university exists in the first place. You've got to go back to the essence of the HBCU establishment. It was to educate, not to party. Right. right. <laughs> right. It was right. to educate. Although Africa. they've done a great job integrating partying into it. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. But, but ultimately, right. but ultimately, <laughs> my brothers, <laughs> stay focused. Right, right. Um, it is to educate us. And, you know, we can laugh about it. Right. And we can say, you know, go have a great time. Enjoy the best times of your life. Yeah. Right. yeah. Because yeah. those are the best times you of will. your life. You will make. But do not memory. get lost. Right. Yeah. In the I, transition. I remember when I graduated from Alcorn and you know everybody's having a good time and excited and my dad walked up to me and he was like I feel sorry for you 
because now it's time for real life. Right, you know, right. You've kicked it the last four years, you know, and you've done what you're supposed to do, but now it's like, it's the real world. Now, hey, right. you know, let's go, you right. know. And so I always remember that time, and like, man, you know, this is going to bust my bubble, you know, right. I graduated. <laughs> like, hey. But he was, <laughs> he was telling the truth, like, hey, it's, it's time to go now, man. It's yeah. like, you know, all that is over with. And so, uh, yeah. What do you think, um, as far as your, your legacy is concerned, what do you want it to be? Wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just, for me, man, I, I just want to be known as a person that um, really cared about his communities, did everything he could to uplift his communities and create equity, yeah. um, especially in my arena, uh, healthcare equity. But not only equity, because equity is opportunity, but I want equitable outcomes. Right. I want results. Yeah. You know, I want the patients that I deal with, the kids that I deal with from DCFS, um, I want them to have significant outcomes. I want them to be successful. I want my patients to receive the same type of medical care that they may have received at one of the elite right. Um, right. hospitals or what have you. You know, you deserve that. It's your right. Yes. And so we have to make sure that this is, and this is what I have dedicated myself to, you know, I. But, you know, and I'm not trying to brag or anything, but with my credentials, I could be working anywhere I want to work. Yeah. But I choose <clears throat> community medicine because that's where my heart is, and that's where we need the most help. That's awesome. I agree. Yeah. Nate? Uh, for me, it's really just helping, helping folks. I mean, your legacy has to be tied to something more than money, yep. more than stuff, mm -hmm. right? More than self. More than self. Right. right. You're right. absolutely right. right. And then you pass that uh, understanding and that mindset along to your children and then because it's very simple if you want to be a blessing right then people are going to get blessed but if you're right. only thinking about how you're going to get blessed then you won't have enough to bless others absolutely right absolutely mm -hmm. I've seen it many many times and so I guess what I want to want to touch on uh, before we uh, wrap up the show is the fact that you can look at the statistics and it showed that only 10% of African-American college students are enrolled in HBCUs. But HBCUs graduate 20% of, of the African-American college graduates annually. And if you look at that statistic a little deeper, you'll see that 50% of African-American teachers come out of HBCUs. If you look a little bit deeper, you'll see about 70% of African-American dentists come out of HBCUs. These are some pretty substantial, substantial statistics that I don't think get publicized enough because you and I know that you have African-American students who try to pursue these occupations at non-HBCUs, oftentimes ending in failure mm -hmm. uh, because of just you don't have the same level of uh, commitment yes, or mentorship uh, tied to the uh, support tied to that program. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you what do you think about that? I just think that it's it's great that we have a platform that we can talk about statistics mm -hmm. and put it out in the open, right? That these things do actually exist, right? And then mm -hmm. we need to get to the numbers, understand the numbers, and then promote ways, build ways, create strategies tactically. Mm -hmm. that alleviate the issue. Otherwise, we're just talking. Right, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And we can't be three sitting here with the beautiful cups and the beautiful set, right? And the beautiful tie, by the way, it's a nice tie, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, and then, and then, <laughs> and then leave here and do nothing. Right, right. But, yeah. but that's the critical thing, right? The yeah. voice has to have some level of execution behind it that's not empty. No, no doubt. There's no been doubt. so many years of emptiness about promoting things while our HBCU establishments, campuses, housing, other facilities, including the athletic facilities, are, are bad. Right. I don't want to say trash. As, we, they're, as, they're we, wind down, same as we wind down the show, I, I don't want to miss this opportunity. Both of you all have made a significant contribution to um, society. You have showed the power and the, the results that HBCUs can produce. And because of that, I want to present each one of you all 
with our HBCU Lifetime Achievement Award. And it's for your outstanding commitment to historically black colleges and universities. I want to thank both of you for being on the show today. And to my viewers, I want to thank you because without you, there's no me.